What's up guys? I'm really excited to share this video with you. I have spent a ridiculous amount of time uh, setting it up. Now, on the last video, I had promised that our next one was going to be about the lathe bed, but um, with all the cold weather, I've been extra, extra careful. I wanna make sure that this paint is super good and dry before I put that clear coat on. I don't want it to wrinkle up like it's done on other times. This story that I'm gonna be about to tell you, it's kind of exciting to me. It's just some new information. You're gonna to wanna to wait all the way to the end to kinda of get the ending of it. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. If you like this, please give it thumbs up and some comments and all that, and hope you enjoy it. I'd like to tell you a story about my South Bend lathe that was made in the 1930s. Now, when I say 1930s, what's the first thing that jumps to your mind? For many, it's the Great Depression that started in October of 1929 and extended through much of the 1930s. And for sure, that was a devastating catastrophe that knocked down GDP worldwide. But there was still a lot of amazing stuff going on in the 1930s. For example, the planet Pluto was discovered. And yes, I know we're supposed to say dwarf planet. And Mickey Mouse's dog Pluto was first announced this same year of 1930. The Empire State Building opened in New York, 1931. The Star Spangled Banner becomes the official U.S. National Anthem in 1931. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, or FDR, was elected president in 1932. Prohibition ends with the 21st Amendment. Cheers, everybody! That was in 1933. The first federal prisoners arrived at Alcatraz Prison in 1934. The FBI was established in 1935. Life magazine publishes its first issue in 1936. The Golden Gate Bridge is completed in San Francisco in 1937. And Bugs Bunny first appears on cartoonist drawing boards in 1938. And my own father was born in 1938. Aww. There was a dark side to the 1930s too. Japan invaded Manchuria as a precursor to World War II in the Pacific in 1931. The Great Black Sunday Dust Bowl storm struck in 1935. The Hindenburg disaster occurred, marking an end to airship travel in 1937. And Nazi Germany invaded Poland in 1939. I want to zoom right into the middle of the decade to 1935, and there's a reason for this particular year that will become clear later. For many, it was a great time to be alive. In January, Amelia Earhart became the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to California, and that's a long flight. In March, Porky Pig made his Looney Tunes debut. In June, Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by two doctors. Hmm, I wonder if it's just a coincidence that Prohibition had been ended two years prior. In August, the Social Security Act was signed into law. In September, FDR dedicated the Hoover Dam. In November, the first cargo plane carrying airmail, the China Clipper, flew from California across the Pacific Ocean all the way to Manila. Okay, now that I have set the stage for the 1930s, I want to change gears, so to speak, and talk about machining. See what I did there? What, nothing? Viewers of this video will probably already realize that we owe thanks for much of our comfortable modern life to machine shops, where inventors like those of the 1930s turned their ideas into tools for transforming the future. The metal lathe, also called an engine lathe, like the South Bend lathe I'm restoring, was one of the fundamental tools in such shops. But another one is the vertical or turret milling machine, which can precisely remove or mill away metal. And here is where the story of my lathe is going to take a surprise turn. I need to tell you first about the Bridgeport mill, so let me start at the beginning. In 1910, a young Swedish man named Rudolf F. Banau came to America at the age of 13. He learned the trade of pattern making, which is the construction of wooden models that are used in the creation of sand molds for iron casting. He worked in a town in Connecticut named Bridgeport, 
which was named for its bridges over the Pequinic River and its shipping port. He eventually rose to foreman at the Bridgeport Pattern and Model Works Company and apparently did well enough that at the age of 30 in 1927, he was able to purchase the company. Remember this company name, Bridgeport Pattern and Model Works. It's going to be important later. A couple of years later, Rudolf Banau brought in Magnus Wallstrom as a business partner, and the two of them set on a project of developing electric hedge clippers. Well, this project was pushed aside when a more important project arose, namely to develop a vertical milling head for the local Atlas Tool Company, which they delivered in 1932. Their product was finally engineered and equipped with a heat-treated and ground spindle running in four precision preloaded bearings with accommodation for heat expansion and contraction. And it had a one-quarter horsepower motor that could drive six different spindle speeds. It was designed to fasten to any of the almost myriad plain horizontal millers in use at the time. They called it their master milling attachment and it was originally designated the Model C. For the history nerds out there, this head will later be called the Model M when it's combined with their future product, and in modern times, it has morphed into the J head. By 1936, this milling head had been upgraded with a one-half horsepower motor and a sliding quill with three and a half inches of travel to improve the unit's drilling and boring ability, and it had a wider speed range. Word spread, and soon they would be selling 500 units a year. But some customers indicated interest in a self-contained machine instead of having to attach this wonderful device onto something else. So in 1936, Banau designed just such a unit. He was sitting in his truck waiting to unload some patterns to a customer when he sketched out the idea on a paper bag. And thus was born what would become the Bridgeport Mill. In August of 1938, the first Bridgeport vertical milling machine was completed and delivered to the plant of the Precision Die Casting Company in Syracuse, New York, for a price of $995. When converted to $2022, this would be $19,700, which is interesting because the current Bridgeport website lists the base price of a new Series 1 mill as $19,600. The originally delivered machine has been preserved and can be seen today at the Precision Museum in Windsor, Vermont. In 1939, the company changed its name from Bridgeport Pattern and Model Works Company to Bridgeport Machines Incorporated. And also in 1939, Hitler's invasion of Poland sadly launched World War II. The rest, as they say, is history. The war effort called for America to ramp up its manufacturing capacity in many ways, starting a golden age of machining. The Bridgeport Mill became immensely popular, and factories for its production were established around the world. It is hard to overstate just how important this mill has become ever since. The design has been widely copied, and many copycat models can still be found. My first mill was a clone made in Taiwan that's so similar that the parts are interchangeable between it and an authentic bridge port. I dare say that anyone anywhere in the world who's had machinist training knows exactly what a bridge port mill is. Now, I said this was a story about my South Bend lathe. So why have I been going on and on about bridge port mills? Well, it turns out that the South Bend Machine Tool Company, which was founded in 1906, has survived over the years. It has been bought and merged with other companies and today is part of Grizzly Industrial Incorporated. And the Grizzly website has an area where one can submit a South Bend lathe serial number and they will send the original sales documentation. They have digitized it and kept it all these years and for $25, they'll send it to you. Nice, right? Well, I entered the serial number stamped on the ways of my lathe, and guess what? When I got back the info, to my great delight, I found that my lathe was delivered on May 31, 1935, to the Bridgeport Pattern and Model Company at 50 Remmer Street, 
Bridgeport, Connecticut. Remember when I said to keep that company name and year in mind? So let's review that company timeline again. 1932, the first universal milling attachment is shipped to Atlas Tools. May 31 of 1935, my South Bend lathe was delivered to them. 1936, the universal milling heads are being sold commercially, and Rudolf Banau sketches the iconic Bridgeport mill design on a paper bag. 1938, the first Bridgeport mill is shipped, In 1939, the company changes its name to Bridgeport Machines Incorporated. So my lathe must have been part of the company's ramping up of production capacity when preparing to deliver the universal milling heads commercially. And certainly it would have still been at work in the shop when the first Bridgeport mill was being developed. That is so cool. I'm very excited to have this tangible relic from the past. I like to think that Rudolf Bano walked by the lathe, laying a hand on its sleek lines and commenting on its sturdy construction. Or, alternatively, maybe he was a grumpy man and kicked the pedestal in frustration after ruining a part as machinists do from time to time. I saw that chipped area, I can only surmise. Well, what happened between its delivery to Bridgeport, Connecticut in 1935 until I picked it up In 2021, in New Milford, Connecticut, a mere 54 miles away, I may never know. But I'm going to keep searching and see what I can find. Thanks for watching.